I'm nine months pregnant, and my fiancé and I were finishing up our meal at a Bob Evans restaurant in Cincinnati, Ohio. We were in our mid-20s when I was pregnant with our first son. So we had finished our meal, and I stood up to leave, and I feel wet, like really wet, like I was sitting in water, probably because I was. I look down and see a small puddle on the floor. I tell my partner who looks down and confirms that, yes, my water had broken in a restaurant that serves homestyle pot roast, which was my favorite. The waitress comes over and I immediately let her know that my water had broken and sorry for my pregnancy juices on the floor. I was more concerned with someone having to mop up the mess I made than my miraculous body getting ready to birth an entire human being. Thank goodness she was calm and understanding. She shooed us out, told me not to worry about the cleanup, and to have a safe delivery, which I did about 27 hours later. The baby boy I delivered is now 23 years old. (laughs) This memory still comes up. A few weeks ago, I had one of those girlfriends remind me as she's laughing, remember when your water broke at Bob Evans? Definitely a vivid moment, not only for me, but for others as well. I wonder if our waitress remembers a time a woman was freaking out because her water broke during her shift at Bob Evans' restaurant. (laughs) In case you're wondering, we left her a really good tip. From WBEZ Chicago, this is When Magic Happens. I'm Cheryl Jackson, here with Jennifer Shaylove Long and Taylor Coward. And what you've just heard was a Black woman's birthing story. And that's what this episode is about. Today, in honor of Black Maternal Health Week, we're talking all about maternity and reproductive care. Now, there's a huge disparity between the quality of care for Black women and birthing people and everyone else. Black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than their white counterparts. And that fact is some... So this week we're going to talk about it, about the enormity that is childbirth and all things vagina. And throughout the episode, you'll be hearing stories from listeners just like you. We asked for your birthing journeys. Some of them are anonymous, ones from Taylor's mom, and all of them are really moving. When I was seven months pregnant, I ended up going to like this prestigious hospital downtown. They took me to the operating room and performed an emergency C-section. And then later, I talked with Dr. Nicole E. Williams, author of This Is How You Vagina, about the very real disparities in gynecological care for black and brown people and what you can do about it. You can just go online. I need a black OBGYN. And as a warning, this episode gets pretty heavy. All that's coming up on When Magic Happens. All right, ladies, what intrigues or amazes you about women and reproduction? That... All of your organs have to be moved around to make space for a baby. That never ceases to amaze, like amaze me. And I saw like a, not a recreation, but how it works on this TikTok account called, I think it's called like the Human Anatomy Lab. Mm -hmm. And so in a cadaver, they moved around the organs to show how the baby kind of just pushes everything around. Oh. Yeah, that yeah. that is amazing. Yeah. I mean, Jennifer, of the three of us, you're the one that actually has given birth. So what amazes you about this? Well, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow. You, you did it a twice. A baby can come out of there? You know, I'm always thinking about mothers and even my own mom pushing me out and what amazing experience that was. I, this is what I imagine. I imagine like a big old ball of hair coming out. <laughs> And her literally, like, me coming out singing and dancing out, like, wiggling out (laughs) and just singing. (laughs) She moonwalked out the womb. (laughs) That sounds like a Disney movie. Okay, what you just described. Okay. (laughs) Oh, I know Um, it wasn't because I've had my own kids. But, yeah. It's possible. You know, it's funny. I have never thought about my mother pushing me out. Really? Mm -mm. Because, you know, they don't talk about that. They don't talk underneath people's clothes. 
that generation. That's yeah, what well, they call you know, it. No, that's true. Talking underneath people's clothes. That's an interesting, maybe generational perspective. Right. Mm-hmm. Because it's like, I've never even heard the phrase of talking under the dress. And I could see how talking that's underneath I've never people's heard of that clothes. Either. That's something yeah. that may not be at the time ladylike or to talk about. Right. That's so interesting. Yeah. My mom tells my birth story, and I also tell my kids their birth story. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, what like, do you tell every them? Bir- what, what do you tell them? Well, every birthday, I recount the story of like me literally going into labor. Like, with my son, for example, I went into labor at like 3 a.m. I got up, I went to the bathroom, and I was like, ooh, I feel like it's time, and went to the um, emergency room and. Actually, the key to this story was like it was so early in the morning. The light was red. I told um, his dad to like run the light, run the red light because I feel like we need to get there. And we got there. And from actually pushing when he came out, he literally had a head full of hair and he had this little heart on his cheek. Mm. And it was, you know, sometimes the actual pigment of your skin isn't fully developed, but mm. it literally was a heart on oh. his cheek. Oh. And he was born at 919 on January 19th. Oh. Wow. Yeah, isn't that cool? He's magical. I love he that. is magical. He is magical. And my daughter's magical too. Let me say okay, that. Okay, all right. <laughs> Mom, why you say that? Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> The birthing experience was one that I wanted to experience naturally. I didn't want her affected by pain medication. So I was using imagery. I had the image of myself um, under a waterfall. I love waterfalls. And surrounded by beautiful flowers. Well, many hours later, um, I was what was considered failure to progress. So I wasn't dilating enough. And the image of the waterfall and the flowers about eight hours later became fire and storms and planes crashing. It was just almost unbearable. And all of a sudden the team rushed in and they said that her heart rate was dropping and they had to do an emergency C-section. So they took me to the operating room and performed an emergency C-section. I later found out that uh, the same team had a similar experience with another mom and her child and unfortunately the umbilical cord had gotten wrapped around the child's neck and so she has a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. I am so so grateful to God every day that this child that came into this world screaming and hollering full of fire and energy um, is with me today. Such a blessing. My mother did share a part of one uh, um, issue she had with the b- birthing story. Mm-hmm. How she went to the hospital because she felt like this. she's going to have the baby. They sent her home mm-hmm. only to come back hours later. And she said it was pandemonium. And mm-hmm. she remembers someone screaming, who sent this woman home? Oh. And that's the only story I know of my mom. She's like, and then they put a shot in her arm and she just... This was for you or for your sibling? This is, I think, for uh, it wasn't with me. Okay. It was oh, okay. a sibling. Okay. But it was that's a sibling. still so scary yeah, to that hear. Because I put your mom at risk. Yes. Mm-hmm. They put the mom. And this is what this story, this whole show is about today. Right. Mm-hmm. Disparities. Yeah. Right. And why this is an issue for black women. So mm-hmm. it's interesting. We've got a lot to unpack. Yeah. You yeah. know, some stuff is it's funny, yeah. but, you know, the some disparities is, is yeah. just and, serious and it's. And I feel like we're just now, maybe not, but just now breaking out of the generations of where difficulties and pregnancies are blamed on the mothers. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's why she felt some a bit of like hesitance in sharing that, because I feel like I I read from the past that the blame will get put on the mom for Mm -hmm. things that are just really out of their control. Let me tell you what, if you were to pull up my YouTube or you know how social media feeds you stuff that you watch once. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I am so fascinated by women having babies mm-hmm. yeah. to this day. I subscribe to channels about it. I, I'm just amazed by the process. Mm-hmm. I never had that opportunity, but I find it so amazing. Yeah. And the various ways that a baby comes into the world. Mm-hmm. One of my friend, actually, he worked for me and his wife had the baby at home and 
he's like, oh, yeah, she's up and about. She had a blow up pool in their living room and she had the in the water in the water. Yeah. So I get there and uh, she had already had the baby. The pool was still there, cleaned out, thankfully. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she had to go there. This woman asked me okay. if I wanted the placenta. She goes to the fridge and said her, her placenta mm-hmm. was in the fridge. Didn't like, would you want a piece of this? Because it's great for the skin. I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good. Don't people now, like she eat had it? Did she just eat it, though, yeah. right? She put it in smoothies. Yeah. Oh, she yeah. like, yeah. It's girl, like nutrient yes. rich. Yeah. Right, very nutrient. <laughs> I'm past on yeah, that. Okay, I'm just going to go on it, take a pop of vitamin. Oh. Okay, so I couldn't go there. You um, know, you already know where I'm about to tell you to go for a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> Miss TikTok. I know Miss TikTok. I <laughs> um, already knew. Because there's a lady who uh she's basically compiling a list of reasons that make her not want to have a kid. So so it'll be there's there's a popular video where a woman was like, My nose grew like three times. It's normal size. I saw that. And so everyone in the comments was like, get the list. Or like uh one lady was like, Oh, my perineum ripped to the point where Oof, like it, I had to get it stapled and sewn and Oof. and they were like, Get the list. And so, <laughs> And so there's so many firsthand stories like moms shoot TikToks from the hospital Mm -hmm. and be like, you would not believe what just happened. I labored for 23 hours and I actually went into it thinking that I was going to do it all natural. And early on, I realized that that was not what I was going to do. It had become unbearable enough that I was it was time for me to go to the hospital So they bring in the anesthesiologist, and she's giving me the epidural, or trying to give me the epidural, and could not find that space in my back to get the needle in. And so she tried several times, and um, I cannot remember a time when I wanted something so bad. And she was like, I can't find the space in your back. I don't think I'm going to be able to give you the epidural. And I, I, I looked at her, and I said, look, you do what you need to do to get it in. And so I'm, you know, good for probably two hours. And then I'm sitting there and I'm starting to feel pain again. And so I'm hitting the button, hitting the button. And there's nothing I felt like coming out because I'm still feeling this pain. So when the nurse comes back and I said, hey, I think this is this is like empty. She says, um, are you feeling pain? And I said, yeah, I'm feeling I'm still feeling the contractions. She said, where? And I point to my lower back and she says, oh, my goodness. You're having back labor. And I was like, back labor? Like, what's that? And she was like, basically, that where the baby's facing you, and every time you have a contraction and the forehead hits, you know, your spine. The unfortunate thing is, is there's nothing that we can do for back labor. And so I continue to have, for probably in the next four and a half, five hours, back labor. I had a very healthy baby girl who was beautiful, and I, all I could do for the really next 30 minutes or an hour, I just wept. I remember having my daughter, and the day I went in for a checkup for her, mm-hmm. they said that um, she actually is decreasing in size, and so they needed me to go to the hospital and deliver her that day, right? And I actually, I was at the, you know, you reach the end where you're just like, I'm done, I'm happy to deliver her. But um, they, I I actually had a doula uh, who kind of helped me through the birthing process. That's awesome. And they said to me that in order to deliver her quicker, that they were going to administer Pitocin. And so with What's my- What's Pitocin? Well- Pitocin is a medicine that basically speeds up the labor process, right? Mm-hmm. So I had done my previous labor naturally, no, no anything. Mm-hmm. And my intention, even with her, was to do it without anything. Um, but they actually ended up administering Pitocin so that they could deliver her quickly. And also, I, I wasn't at the point where I would have labored mm-hmm. in that particular time frame. And so anyway... Um, I distinctly remember my doula saying to me, because somebody said, oh, this will be quick. It'll be easy. She was like, Jennifer, this is not going to be quick, and this is not going to be easy. Mm-hmm. It actually intensifies your feeling of labor. Oh, right? Wow. And so my daughter um, 
actually ended up being born in 45 minutes, Ooh. which is literal. Is that is just that's unheard of, right? Just the wow. time period. So, so my son, it was seven hours. She was born in 45 minutes. And I will tell you that literally I felt my body change, you mm-hmm. know, where your body just kind of goes into almost like a shock. You know, I went from hot to cold to sweating to freezing to just all the feelings that you can feel. Mm-hmm. I felt that, mm. right? And the thing that just struck me about that was was literally the doula looking me in my eye and saying, Jennifer, this is not this isn't this isn't going to feel easy for you. Right. Right. And I wish actually that she she wasn't there when they uh, put in the order to do it. But I think she would have told me, don't do it. Just mm-hmm. wait or right. do something different or come up with another alternative. Well, how much weight was she, the baby losing that you had to deliver well, her in 45 minutes? Well, well, not that I had to deliver her in 45 minutes. That's how quickly the actual the laboring process. Okay. It, it, mm-hmm. it shouldn't have been that fast. Like it should have been at least a couple hours, something, right. you know? Mm-hmm. And basically what they were looking at was from my last visit to that visit, she was not growing as they had imagined. So she actually was born at about four pounds, right? Bless her heart. She was so cute, but but healthy and right. fine and all that good stuff. But it certainly, you know, just when you think about the things that can happen, even the things that happen to a woman, you know, giving birth to a child, your body has to. Well, it's so dangerous. It's very dangerous. Very did you dangerous. did you notice your recovery was different? Oh yeah. After a different type of birth experience. Yes. yes. Okay. Absolutely. So like, what, what was it after? Like the, the difference between yeah. the two. So with my son, I feel like it was very natural. You know, I did have you know soreness, and I I did feel. Some postpartum, but not heavy postpartum, because I don't think my body was in the same kind of shock. This was the other thing they said was, and I had the same doula for both children. Mm -hmm. She would always encourage me, just listen to what your body's telling you to do. Mm -hmm. You know, if your body is telling you to push, you know, if your body's telling you just to relax, if your body, you know, whatever your body's telling you to do, it is your guide through Mm -hmm. this process. And so you just, just listen to it. Mm -hmm. And... Was she in the labor room with you? She was. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. And she was wonderful because she would do things like look at me and be like, okay, she needs some ice. Or she'd nice. rub my leg. Or, you know, she'd yes. do things that I didn't even know that I needed her to do. Right. Um, but with my son, it was very a, a natural healing process, you know, mm-hmm. where I just felt like, okay, gradually I can get back to being myself. But with my daughter, after kind of going through that sort of body shock, if you will, it was a lengthier process, right? Mm-hmm. And in fact, you know, I don't know this that they are linked. I mean, I would I would argue that they aren't linked, mm-hmm. but just how my body changed and then I had this acute form of leukemia all of a sudden wow. after that, you know? Wow. Did they at least try to give you an explanation as to why? Well, the estrogen levels were higher or something, something. Did they give you anything? This was the thing that I noticed even the when I we were, you know, kind of in the recovery room for my daughter. Um, they do blood work. Right. And they just sort of evaluate your blood and make sure that, you know, everything's stabilized. But the one thing that was unusual for me was my my platelet counts were very low. And um There was another thing, but I just distinctly remembered the platelet counts and there was some other blood thing, but it was not um, normal, right? Meaning it wasn't my normal, like bounce back, like Mm kind of thing. And so that in and of itself to me was a red flag. And had I had the foresight to even think like kind of the correlation between the two, the way my body was feeling after having birth that way and then seeing like, oh, these markers look weird for me then I maybe would have been a little bit more reactive about, you know, I, I don't know. I think I would have been reactive in a different way. So do you think that maybe the healthcare professionals didn't have maybe your well-being in mind when you got the Pitocin? Was was the, I mean, because I, I hear sometimes 
you kind of have to split the focus on mom and the baby. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there seems to be a struggle in who do we administer to in this moment. Mm -hmm. And so what was in evaluating everything later? um, What did you think about how you were handled by the healthcare professionals and your well-being in that process? I mean, I think I was handled. That's a good question. I mean, I think I was handled fine. I think I would have wanted more time to think. Okay. Mm. I would have wanted more time to think about and and like it's literally like you're in the birthing room, they're going to give you pitocin. Like everything felt too rushed to me, and I think I would have taken a beat. When I was seven months pregnant, I ended up going to like this prestigious hospital downtown and the ER doctor like totally dismissed my symptoms. I don't know, because he, you know, I always pride myself on working in this field. I had all my scrubs because I was leaving work. I had on my ID. I was, you know, pronouncing my body parts right, saying the correct terms. And he like totally dismissed me. So I end up like, you know, walking out the emergency room, bent over in pain. And they dismissed me and sent me home to take Tylenol. And he didn't even touch me, run any type of test to see. He just assumed it was Braxton contraction, which I'm explaining to him that, like, no, I, I've been pregnant before. Like, I understand. I like I, I know the feeling when I'm go- having contraction. So it just so happens I end up going to Stroger. And I, I'm, I'll never forget this later. I met this young black emergency room doctor and she came and she was feeling on me and she was like well it sounds like it's your appendix so they end up running like doing an um, MRI and it was my appendix in the in between baby one and two I had gotten pregnant or what I thought was a pregnancy but I ended up having um, like hemorrhaging so the doctor, we went to the emergency room, did a scope and told me that, you know, the sack would pass and that there was nothing in my womb besides an empty birth sack. So the diagnosis was unfertilized chorionic villi. And he told me that, you know, over the next 48 hours that my body would dispel the empty container, you know, like, for lack of a better word. And I proceeded to take my alive and well and bouncing child to the mall to my mother-in-law's chagrin. She said, you know, what are you going to do when your body dispels this empty parcel? And I said, we called her mama. I said, you know, mama, It's going to happen whether I'm laying at home in bed feeling sorry for myself or I'm moving around. And that's exactly what happened. You know, I went to the restroom and out came this this bubble and we froze the bubble and took it to the lab. And that was that, you know, which is hard on my hubby. So, Cheryl, I want to know about your experiences. What have you experienced? Well, girl, let me tell you what. I felt like I was um, going through labor every month, okay, (laughs) with my cycle. It was in, I had very painful cycles and the contractions, the cramps felt like huge contractions, Mm. but there was no baby at the end. So Mm. I'd be balled up. Um, I would pass out sometimes. The pain was so intense. This is before ibuprofen. Right. Um, but what, wait. It, it was just a terrible experience, um, my cycles for me. And so while I've never had a child, um, my, you know, my reproductive health, my my menstrual cycles were just uh, onerous. Yeah. To be, to put it lightly. And do you know, like, what what caused that? Well, you know, when going through this young, I mean, I'm, what, 
15, 16, everyone around me just normalized it. Mm. Like, oh, it's just being a woman. Mm-hmm. I'm like, but I'm, but it I'm hurts. in the library because right. I had to leave class and yeah. I'm on the floor of the library. <laughs> this right. is not normal. Right. But I, and, and instead of saying it's not normal, remember librarian who was also, you know, really um, kind of an aunt like figure just told me, well, you're going to have to do better about this because in college you cannot leave class and you cannot. Mm-hmm. And when you grow up and have a job, you can't just be off your job just because you have cramps. Right. So you're going to have to get it together. Mm-hmm. So that was the whole thing is get it together. And mm-hmm. people still maybe aren't taking it as seriously. Marce Martin, the young actress yeah. from, oh, yeah. I think yes. it's Blackish. Yes. Blackish. Yes. She just yeah. got surgery because she said that she would just have excruciating pain. Mm-hmm. And so when I had my own personal pain as I started to menstruate, and I started to menstruate early at nine. Mm. So you can't go to another third grader and be like, got a pad. You know? right. 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 <laughs> and so there was so much that I didn't know. I didn't know what was supposed to be happening. But at the time, there's these American Girl doll books. I know. I bought them for my nieces. I love them. They're about your body. Yes. And so I was like flipping through it. And it told me like how to put in a tampon, how to do this, how to do that. But it never really hit on the pain. And so I was like, maybe it's just me. Um, And so I was so happy to see Marseille's story. Not happy that she was suffering, but happy that she came out about it because people don't take it seriously. They don't. And, you know. I, because um, ultimately my fertility was stolen from Mm-mm. me um, because I went undiagnosed mm. for so long. Mm-hmm. And so now I am such a huge advocate. Yes. It is not normal to have painful periods, it's just discomfort, right. but not when you're passing out, right. yeah. not, not when, when you're balled out. up on the floor. Yeah. I remember <laughs> I was freshman in college and I... I would get in a depressive state. I would start crying because I knew my cycle was coming mm. and the pain. And I called my dad. And I was just crying. Was what's wrong with you, Cheryl Beth? Cheryl Beth. Now the world knows my middle name, Cheryl but I Beth. used Cheryl to hate. Beth. I know, right? <laughs> what's wrong with you, Cheryl Beth? You know, fathers they cannot take it when their daughters mm. are in. I said, I'm just, I'm just got these cramps. Okay, okay, I'm getting in the car right now. I'm coming. I'm from Memphis. He's jumping in the car <laughs> to come to Chicago. And then when you get here, what are you going to do? Right. Beat up your um, uterus. Exactly. <laughs> fight her. Exactly. He's going to fight my uterus. <laughs> but it was that kind of trauma for me around uh, my cycles. And I used to always tell myself, mm-hmm. well, this will be worth it when mm-hmm. I get through because I, I get to have a baby when I have children. Mm-hmm. This will all this pain will all be worth it. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? I couldn't get to have a baby wow. because it took my infertility. So I advocate to young women and mothers mm-hmm. about their daughters mm-hmm. to tailor. It's not you already know it's not normal. Yeah. But get as much information. I think black women, when possible, need to see a black woman uh, gynecologist because yep. they're going to hear you in ways that others will not. Oh, wow. So we've got so many questions, so much to unpack here about this conversation. It's a uh, it's a big one. We've warned our audience that it's going to be kind of heavy at times. Um, but I'm excited about our special guests to help us address this. Coming up, Dr. Nicole E. Williams tells us about pregnancy, childbirth and answers all of the questions about black maternal health. That's coming up. Vaginas have always been maligned in our culture. They're always seen as something dirty, disgusting, a place that should be hidden, and you should be ashamed of having one when half of Earth has one. Come on. And that is why I say you call the thing what the thing is. Look, when yeah. I went into the gynecologist at 33, talking about, oh, I want to have, you know, have a child, I want to get pregnant. And she referred to my pregnancy, why it would be pregnancy, as geriatric pregnancy. Oh, I hate that. I was like, uh, what? what? Mm-hmm. Would, ma'am, 
Okay, I'm not Sarah in the Bible. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, that that is unfortunate. We change that. Yeah, it's, it's way they better now. They don't say geriatric pregnancy. No, we pregnancy. call it advanced maternal age. Okay. It sounds so much more delightful <laughs> than, no, not really, not, but, but yes, that's a big issue for us as well. So we are delaying mm-hmm. or we're doing very early. And then when we are pregnant, we are not armed with the knowledge and the support that it takes to have a healthy pregnancy, full term vaginal birth, because that is what's supposed to happen. So in 1970, the vaginal birth rate was 95 percent, C-section 5 percent, 1970. But in 2021, mm-hmm. it was, oh, 30 percent. What? And 36 percent for African-American women. We have, we have, of course, we have more C-sections. Uh-huh. Why is that? <laughs> so one of the big issues that I have found is, well, it, you get paid more money oh. for a C-section. Mm-hmm. Way more money. Hospital makes around $25,000 for a C-section. And, well, they can charge around $25,000. And around $15,000, 12 to fifteen or so, for a vaginal birth. Like healthy woman, mm-hmm. boom, push out a baby, all done. But if you get a C-section, oh, there's all this equipment right. and all the nursing and right. la, la, la. That's money. Secondarily, they think that we cannot make our own choices, so those choices are often made for us. I'm just getting angry. I'm I know, getting right, hot. I know. That's why we're hot. here. Next thing, they think that we don't know what we're doing. We don't know our own bodies. So then we're like, oh, okay, well, you just need a C-section. Third thing is there hasn't been enough data to say that continuous fetal monitoring actually saves babies. So if the baby's heart rate kind of goes just a little bit erratic, just a Mm. little bitty bit, they're Mm -hmm. like, ooh, C-section. Oh. But in actuality, that it just may be, well, the baby's getting pushed. Right. And of course the heart rate's going to change somewhat. But we practice a lot of reactive medicine. So then, oh, go C-section. And for some reason, we believe that African-American women, when you look at continuous fetal monitoring, is slightly different. But doesn't mean that the babies are not going to make it and won't have and won't be very viable and very vigorous when they get here. Right. Yeah. That, I, I just am getting hot. Okay? I know. And, and I already knew the disparities. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot. I know some of the disparities uh, for black women and maternal health. Um uh, reproductive health, but hearing these added insights, I mean, yep. we need to run, not walk, to a black gynecologist. But there are so few of you all. There's way more than you think. We have a lot of resources now. You can just go online. I need a black OBGYN, or not. And you're not just having a black doctor is going to make you better. But somebody who is more culturally competent and aware of the social determinants of health, aware that the fact that racism and weathering is what results in an increased morbidity and mortality. For example, if you have a patient who is also black and they come from, oh, somewhere on the continent or South American black people, and they come here first generation, Mm -hmm. what are their morbidity and mortality rates? Same as white people. What? Whoa. What? What? So what that tells us is just just being in America. Then the second generation of like, so you have somebody who comes from Senegal, and they deliver their baby here, totally fine, morbidity and mortality, same as white people, same as the general population. If she has a daughter... And that daughter is raised in the United States. Genetics came just from Senegal, right? Yes. Her morbidity and mortality rate when she delivers a baby comes right back to us. That's crazy. Hmm. I run a telehealth company, by the way. um, very nice. For black and brown people, okay, because we know social determinants are real. Real. um, And disparities are real. Um, We know reproductive issues. For black women, like fibroids, 
endometriosis are quite common. That Mm -hmm. has been the bane of my existence. Um, With issues like endometriosis, fibroids, preeclampsia, why are they so common for black women? Well, it does have to do with the fact that many of us came from West African descent here in the United States. So fibroids is genetic. I have a lot of patients who believe that it came from eating red meat or it came Drinking from... Drinking milk. Oh, yeah, no dairy. No dairy. Like, you know, I, I love meat and I love dairy. And I have one fibroid. It's small. It's been there most of my life and it hasn't grown. We don't know why some people's fibroids stay small and other people's blow up to the size of cantaloupes. I had to remove one uh, maybe last month. It was like a watermelon. We don't know why. But the theory is it's genetic. Now, most women are going to have a fibroid sometime in their lives. In fact, 70% of women are going to have a fibroid by the time they're 50. Like I said, I have one, and it's just sitting there, and I didn't even know I had it until I threw my back out. I had an MRI, and I was like, oh, look at that. I have a fibroid. But other women are just decimated every month, bleeding out, wearing black. Right. All of these things. Horrible. So we think it's genetic. Endo. Now, the thing about endo. Endometriosis. Yeah, endometriosis. Mm -hmm. That is a condition where the stuff on the inside of the uterus, instead of coming out the vagina, it squirts through the tubes, gets into the pelvis. You have like the tissue and stuff Mm -hmm. that's supposed to come out. Mm -hmm. It stays in your body. And then every time you make enough estrogen, it starts to react and it causes pain. It can cause debilitating pain. You know what? I'm 58 years old. Mm-hmm. I had pain since the day, 15, the first day I menstruated, 15. Yep. Debilitating pain. Mm-hmm. On the floor, passing out pain. Sounds like endometriosis. No one ever told me I had endometriosis. Ooh, want me to tell you why? Why? Ooh, I can tell you why. <laughs> tell me why. So... We are more diagnosed with having a condition called pelvic inflammatory disease, which is a condition that occurs from having a sexually transmitted disease, than actually having endometriosis. But when they looked at this, and my own mentor, Dr. Donald Chapman, may he rest in peace, actually looked at a bunch of black women who were diagnosed with pelvic inflammatory disease and found that half of them actually had endometriosis. Wow. And did not have a sexually transmitted disease. But when we show up in the ER with pain... Now, everybody gets a shot of antibiotics, but we are more likely to just get a little pat on the head, be like, oh, you know, it's just PID. You know, it's just, you know, it comes from having an STD. And you can be sitting there and be like, I never had no STD. Right. I have a husband. What you talking about? Right. But they still treat us just because when we walk in there and we look like what we look like, they're going to assume you have an STD. Even if you go to your doctor and you're like, well, I've had this pain and it's been right here. It's been going on for years. They'll still go. Oh, well, here, you know, let's check STDs. Wow. But it's endometriosis. Wait a minute, girl. I need a minute. Okay. Or a glass of wine, something. Okay. Later. (laughs) Gotta give. All right. (laughs) This is a lot right now. Do you understand the pain that I have? And no one told me. Right. And we're more likely to be ignored. Yes. Because of what, just because of who we are and what we look like. And they think that we have no knowledge. And that's why we're here today, to give you that knowledge. Because if you have pain outside of menstruation, not just, oh, I ovulated kind of pain. Mm -hmm. But this is this pain you can feel. It's at one Mm -hmm. spot. Mm -hmm. And it's always in that same spot. It's more likely to be endometriosis. And you should, if you feel this pain, you go to your doctor and you demand, you know what? Hey, I think I have endometriosis. I should have a workup for that. And if they go, oh, then guess what? This is America still. And go get another doctor. Right. You can go down the street, get on the Internet easily. Find someone who will actually listen and validate your concerns as opposed to ignore them. Okay. What you said. Okay. So (laughs) (laughs) Uh, why is that, that um, no matter you know, your background or your mm-hmm. economic status. Serena and Beyonce. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Beyonce bought out like the whole floor of Cedar Sinai in California. And it's still, she still suffered morbidity. Serena Williams, billionaire, tennis player in 
better shape than all of us sitting okay. in this room. Me too. I'm skinny, but dog. I'm like, she's like, <laughs> what? Right. She had a blood clot. And guess what? She wasn't listened to. Serena Williams was still not listened to. Billionaire, savvy, in incredible shape. So she knows her body. Right. And when she said, and she'd had, and it's not like this is some brand new thing. She know she'd had a blood clot before. Right. So it makes sense that somebody who's in that kind of state where your body is doing, doing all this turning and stuff that you might have would be in what we call a hypercoagulable state, meaning you're just more likely to form clots. And she did. And nobody listened to her until it was doggone mission critical. We are just not listened to no matter. We can throw billions of dollars at everything. Beyonce, whole half side of the hospital was hers and still had complications, high blood pressure. Come on, people. Right. We're not really listened to. And what we need to do to fix that yes, what? is we need more advocates in our birthing room. And what we need are doulas. We need doulas to be covered by insurance. So now, right now, only rich people can have a doula. And that's an independent advocate. They know birth, and they can be a calm voice to say, hey, you know, my patient is feeling like this. I think that this should be a thing. We should actually work this up. We should investigate what's going on with her because things seem a little off. That's what we need. But unfortunately, even though we have, we're getting more and more data saying doulas are great, doulas are great. You know, people don't want to pay for that. The government don't want to pay for that. And insurance companies damn well don't want to pay for that. (laughs) They barely want to pay for the basics. Right. Right. I mean, dog, all I can get is a pap smear and a mammogram. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I love it. I love your energy, sis. Okay. (laughs) So here's what I do. I'm planting more than a seed. I'm telling my my nephews and every young black woman, my nephews, my nieces, I'm going to tell the nephews too, but my nieces <laughs> and every young black woman mm-hmm. um, to uh, preserve your eggs. Oh, yeah. They, we don't get told that. Oh, I tell they them all tell the time. They don't black women Oh, of that. course not, because nobody wants black eggs. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Just tell us what you really think. You know, nobody Williams. wants black, black eggs. eggs. Oh, my God. It's, it's terrible. So I tell my patients this. Look, just get a credit card, get a brand new credit card. They're still giving them out. Charge that bad boy up and then just pay it off over a year or so. It's worth it. Yeah. Because even though only half of the eggs that are preserved actually end up going through like an IVF cycle Mm -hmm. and and getting placed and even less than are actually get placed. But still, it's an insurance policy that is worth it, even if you have an inkling that you might want to have a baby right before you're 35. And I hate to say it because, ugh, you know, we went to grad school and then we, we were smart and we we're right. going our careers and things are going great. And they're like, oh, crap. I want right. to have a baby. Exactly. I'm 38. Ah, right. But this is why I tell my patients, you get the foresight, put them in the freezer, put them in the freezer, Just put them in the freezer. Uh, young ladies, young sisters out there, if you're listening, mm-hmm. get your eggs, okay? <laughs> oh, and your one black more eggs. thing. Oh, my God. Harvested. And one more thing I really want to mention is that women think that by having their eggs um, frozen, mm-hmm. that somehow they have less eggs. I've, no. I've actually heard that. Yes, they really think. So you're born with like 200-something thousand eggs. So if they take out 15... You're probably still going to have plenty of yes, eggs right. left. And it doesn't decrease your fertility and the hormones that we have to give you. We have to do this. We have to rev up the system that we actually have to give you. They're not dangerous long term because you're doing this over the course of a couple of months of your life. So right. just know that these things are actually have been clinically proven and studied over time. Considering the history of the field of gynecology, and black women's bodies as the non-consensual site for experimentation in the field, how do you reconcile this fact as uh, a black woman? It's really, really difficult. So um, back in the, I think it's the early 1800s, we'll just say, you know, 19th century, it was Dr. J. Marlon Sims, who is con- who was considered the father of gynecology. What happened was there was a white woman who was thrown from a horse And she ended up developing what's called a fistula, which is a condition where the bladder and the vagina are connected. So you're just peeing out of your vagina all the time. 
and he didn't know what to do with it. So he actually worked on slave women. And the three that we have in history, their names are Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka. And they were operated on and experimented upon multiple times Mm. and actually served as each other's so they served as a surgical assist on each other's surgeries. Oh, my God. And this was anesthesia-free. There, there was no wonderful oh, drugs to put you to sleep then. Mm. Multiple, multiple times. And all we have are first names of these wonderful history-making women who endured so much. Mm. And, yeah. So how do That's I reconcile that? Heartbreaking. It's It's difficult because That's we've been experimenting. Oh, it's so, I know. But we have to know, we see the wonderful thing about doing this and talking about these things, we're getting that knowledge out there. So people will know that, yes, this happened, but it will never happen again. Because there are too many of us out there who have this knowledge and are not going to let that happen. We will not let another Tuskegee happen again. Because Mm. these things took our humanity and lowered it to the level of animals. It took away the humanity. Mm-hmm. I feel like I, you've taken me on this roller coaster uh, ride. But now we're educated even more. And once you internalize it and you process this information, you're going to come out smarter and wiser oh and God. more empowered on the other side. Can you tell me their names again? Betsy. Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka. We need to remember those names. We need to remember those ladies. You know the phrase, um, say their names? Mm -hmm. We need to always say their names, Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka, and never forget those names. I think that was the most soul-crushing part of that interview to hear how black women were so inhumanely sacrificed. Um, It brought me to tears. And then to know that it still happens. Mm -hmm. It's still ongoing her comments about listening to your body Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know your body better than anybody. And just even, especially the example of like Beyonce and Serena Williams, like they were not being heard. Mm -hmm. Right. And how important it is to, even in the midst of not being heard, you gonna hear me. Mm -hmm. Like you just, it just, it's, it's a, frustrating. A having... world class athlete, yeah, who had a history of blood clots, yes, who knows their body who knows professionally, their body. yes. You still, and so that it just shows that it's like, and yeah, then, you're not listening, yeah. And then B, she bought out the entire hospital. That's how much money she has, mm-hmm. right? Still, not, did not save her. Mm-hmm. But I, I also had such joy listening to such a upbeat educated, you know, well-versed clinician Mm -hmm. that is a black woman and that is a champion of black women's health. Mm -hmm. It was so inspiring to hear her. And, and that just, that gave me a glimmer because that's what the sacrifice pays off for in the end that we now have a Dr. Nicole E. Williams. You write that Dr. Nicole um, E. Williams is just, you know, such a resource, mm-hmm. advocate, and champion. She talked about so much mm-hmm. that we have to do a two-parter on this. Um, um, so I'm, I'm excited about uh, hearing more from her at a later date. Uh, but it was a great conversation um, and a starting conversation to get us thinking about our bodies mm-hmm. um, differently. So um, that's it for part one. Uh, of our series of Black Maternal Health. Uh, special thanks to our guest this week, Dr. Nicole E. Williams, author of This Is How You Vagina. She's amazing. 
And another big thank you to all those who share their stories with us. Shantina Williams, Julie Listenby, Kimberly Hess, Tracy Brown, Luzanne Green, and everyone else. We thank you so much. For part two next week, we're talking with Congresswoman Robin Kelly all about what's next for us all after the end of Roe versus Wade. If you've got something to say about how the decision has impacted your life, tell us. Our email address is magic at wbez.org. Email us, send us a voice memo. We want to hear from you. And also, big news, we are launching a newsletter, the perfect companion to this podcast. You wanted more magic? We heard you. We've got listener spotlights, links to episodes, sassy quotes from yours truly, hot topics, and so much more. Don't miss out and join our email community at wbez.org slash newsletters. And if you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe, rate us on Apple Podcasts, and tune in every Friday for your dose of When Magic Happens. And follow us on Instagram at When Magic Happens Podcast. When Magic Happens is a production of WBEZ Chicago. Our truly magical producer is Brianna Garrett. A. Our associate producer is Elizabeth Cambridge. Brendan Benazak is our executive producer. Tracy Brown is chief content officer. Editing by Justin Bull. Engineering by Dave Miska. See y'all next week.